Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the wonderful Patty Considine to talk all about House of the Dragon. And, you know, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about your initial character development with, with playing him in the show, because there's so many different internal conflicts and, and battles at play for him. You know, he's someone who is in this position as king, but you yourself have said that he's not necessarily a natural leader because he's trying to lead with empathy. He's trying to please everyone around him, which is something that you just can't do. You know, there's the conflict internally with everything with his relationship with his brother with naming his daughter a successor and so there's so much at hand that's going on as an internal dialogue for him as a character that you're playing to throughout the season and I was really interested in kind of where the initial through line of of finding him as a character was and, and what the main foundation was that you wanted to build upon. Well I think that all the things you spoke about were the the things that interested me the most about playing him um, I, I didn't see him as one dimensional at all when I when I read him. Um, I thought that was the real it was real um, different to sort of see or read a character from that world that wasn't driven in, in, a, in a position of power, but, but wasn't driven or corrupted by that power at all. I thought that was interesting. Um, as far as his role as king, he, it, to him, it's duty and. He, he was always carrying this secret with him of a prophecy um, that was bigger than the world. And, and he explains it in the first episode to Rhaenyra that the prophecy is bigger than him. It's bigger than her or in Ep3 or something. It's bigger than everybody. This thing, that secret that I carry or this prophecy, it, it's about the fall of man in this, in this world. And he, he believes in that. So he's got this kind of, at, the, at his core, he's got this belief that he's carrying, that he really does believe in. Um, that if he tried to explain that to Damon or to Otto, for example, you know, Reese and Matt, they wouldn't, they'd laugh him out of the room, you know. But um, And so I always felt like I was playing a character with a secret who was being perceived by everybody else to be weak. Um, but in actual fact, I always saw him as somebody that saw through the illusion of the game more than anything else and wasn't willing to play it. So in that sense, I feel that Viserys is a lot more of a dreamer and an outsider because the, everybody else is so corrupted and, con and so consumed with their own journeys and the importance of, of, of the throne and power. And he's the opposite. He, he's thinking about the bigger picture and the world at large which made him incredibly interesting. If he was a guy that was just fiery and he was starting wars everywhere, well, what's the point? And, and it wasn't interesting to me to play a tyrant. It would have been too easy. And I wanted the challenge. And I thought this was challenging to have all those different characters, all those different relationships to be able to, to work off and, and, and work with. Um, but I think he's very much an outsider. I think he's a lonely man. Uh, events in the first episode where he, he, he doesn't choose to kill his wife, as some people believe, to save a kid. They're, they're both going to die, but he chooses to put her through a very terrible procedure that um, is horrific. It's a horrific death for her. And that's something that never, ever leaves him. So he's a very kind of haunted man. Doesn't know what to do. The throne rejects him. You know, everything rejects him. Um, so, and I thought the mental decay and the physical decay was something that was representative of, of the decay that was going on around him and also the struggle that he was having to try and keep peace within this kingdom and stay on his own private mission. So I thought it was great. So early on when people were watching the show and they were saying, oh, Viserys is weak, you know, it kind of annoyed me because he's not weak and he, and he doesn't bow to Rhaenyra. There's a great episode in one of the, a scene in one of the episodes where he tells her that, you know, this prophecy is bigger than ours and it's bigger than you going to whorehouses with Damon. And, you know, he says you have to marry because it's your duty. That's what we have to do. You want this? This is what we have to deal with. We have to deal with duty. And he kind of marries her off to the sea snake's daughter. And she makes a bargain with him and says, well, get rid of your hand then and I'll marry. And I think people thought that Viserys was bowing down. I never saw it as that. I always, in my mind, was like Viserys was kind of teaching her how to play the game. And it was actually admirable that she had a counter to him. Do, do you know what I mean? That she could counter him. And he's going, okay, because that's all this is. It's a game. And the final blow in that scene was when he doesn't fully trust her 
or believe her that she hasn't had sex. So he sends her a tea to effectively abort any possible accidents. And that's him saying, yeah, that's that's duty, that's us. But this is dad saying, drink this tea. You know, he's not a pushover and he's not an idiot. And I think that's how he was perceived early on. And he's not. He's just a man who's not driven by power, who thinks there's a greater uh, thing at play here that that uh, I must kind of uh, be faithful to and trust. Absolutely. And that, that's the complexity that makes it it's such a great character and performance. And what you're bringing up there about the, the isolation and the fact that he's an outsider as someone sitting on the most powerful seat in the in the kingdom is such an interesting dichotomy for someone who, you know, following the death of his wife in episode one, he also had to remarry for duty. Um, yeah. You know, and he, he draws the line at marrying a literal child, um, you know, but kind of takes Alison yeah. as, as his wife. And, you know, now that we've moved forward several years, we see the progression of that relationship, them having had a child together, but there's still this real sense of grief and loss in him that you've managed to carry. And so what were the challenges that came with having to really fast track that relationship with his first wife in, in episode one? And then how did you think about the way that you wanted that grief to, to be a constant presence as part of the isolation that you were talking about before? Yeah, I think it's just because you could go another way with it and carry it too much. And that's what it becomes. It becomes too melancholic. And I was also aware of that. And I can't just be this melancholic guy all the way through. You know, we the, the the grief's a strange thing, you know, there's no sort of uh, set way to deal with it, the strategies, but um, ultimately you you just have to get on and live with your life. But it's just something I think that haunts him forever, but you've got to make sure that it doesn't become the absolute like, kind of anchor of how you play the part. But, you know, he's plagued by a lot of things, Viserys. He's, you know, he's always being for the, the job is that you're always being forced to make decisions, whether it's to support a, an illegal war, you know, because that's what his brother starts with the sea snake and he can't be seen. If that was real life, people would be up in arms about it. I know we're talking fantasy, but he's a good man and he, he, he doesn't want to do it. And then it becomes about his brother undermining him and him looking weak for not going and helping his brother. But in life, you, you can't do that. You can't just go and support illegal wars, though people do. Um, so, I mean, it was just important to, I'm, I'm trying to sort of remember my point when it comes to his relationships, but I think it was that sense of duty that he's always being forced to do something. And he seems to be like, marry a 12 year old girl. And he seems to be the only person that steps back from it all and says, this is absolute madness. Does nobody in this kingdom have any morals? And I think that's why he suffers so badly because he's in this world of corruption where people are single-minded and they're always conniving. And he's not, you know, he's a, he's a morally good man. And I think that makes him interesting when he's trying to struggle with all these other things. But I think he takes on Alison as a, as a wife just because in a time of grief, she becomes a good companion for him. And then being forced into a situation to, uh, in a power play by call, is to marry his daughter I think he has to count us and cut that down. So Alison's the only kind of choice, you know? So he's always being forced into these situations to make decisions because the outside world are always forcing stuff on him. And he's always trying to do the right thing. And you can't, you can't do the right thing by everybody. And what makes him lonely too is that, you know, he's a man who has an ego. He, he does say at one point, how will I be remembered? They won't sing about me in songs. I'm not a great warrior. I didn't start wars. They remember tyrants. They don't talk about people like me in the histories. I'm forgotten. So there's all these other things, a part of him saying, what's, what's the point of all this? You know, I'm, so he's always having these crises in his, in his head about his own existence. But, um, and, that, and that, again, I think is something that I found really beautiful and interesting about him. And, and speaking of tyrants brings me to talking about his relationship with his brother Damon um, and the complexities between the two of them, because you can kind of tell that he spent his whole life with people being like, you know, you need to just cut him off, just let him loose. And you can see the push and pull of he wants to have this relationship with his brother, but there's moments where he has to push him away for that sense of duty. So again, it's, it's another one of those internal conflicts that we were talking about before, but there is such a space of love that we see in that dynamic as well. And, and so how did you set about creating 
meeting and figuring out what that dynamic looked like on screen where there is such an element of conflict but from a well because you, you you draw on many things you draw on your own experiences with your own siblings too you know because sometimes that's very dysfunctional and um you know, sometimes you'll go, they said that, well, I'm not talking to them for six months. I'm going to punish them by not answering their calls for six months and silly things like that because you can't communicate. And it's it's harder to articulate with siblings and people that of your blood that you truly love than it is with a friend because there's something that's that's just inherently between you. You know, you've shared a womb and... There's just bonds between you that you you cannot break, and I think it makes it more difficult for people to speak their minds because in in amongst all these conflicts, there is this overwhelming sense of love. I think I think from Damon's point of view, how I read it when we made it was that he was very much struggling in some way with the fact that he's lost his brother, um, because they did used to spend a lot of time together. And Damon says, you know, you used to go to the whorehouses. In, in you know in one of the episodes and yeah Viserys did when he was younger and that's what they would do but not not when he found Emma not when not 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 in that sense um so I think sometimes I think sometimes Damon thinks he's lost him um but it, it's nothing that Viserys can't help he's, he's torn between duty and I think he's somebody who makes a lot of excuses for his brother you know and is always making excuses in front of his counsel and defending him. And, and either Damon's antagonistic or he just cannot help it. He just can't help himself. And I think, I don't think Damon's driven by power, but there's, there's, I think there's a sense of entitlement of being a prince that Viserys doesn't have. And I fucking resent entitlement as a man. And so I think in those conflicting scenes when I'm sitting on the throne, and I'm looking at Damon and he's behaved badly or he's, he's taken my daughter to a whorehouse and because he knows the game is all about perception and he's paranoid about people talking. Um, I think he, he then becomes, he becomes more of a dragon and it's more about duty in that sense by banishing him. And that's painful to do when it's a, when it's a loved one. That This is my job. I'm only doing my job. You know, but I can't let Damon just get away with anything he wants. But paranoia does start to get to uh, Viserys, and he does love his brother because he reaches out to him later on, and you know, as he's sort of physically demising, and um, you know, it's a hard thing to watch. But I think that's what siblings are like sometimes, and and our sense of duty in all things. You know, imagine if you had to go to if you were a policeman and you went to someone's house and. You know, it, and you arrest your brother or a family member or something. I don't know how it went, but, you know, it would be the equivalent of sentencing someone in court. You know, it's, it's a strange thing, but, uh, yeah. I did also want to talk about some of some of the external aspects of your performance in the show because you're you're playing him in this in this way where he's not posturing and ceding his power as king in the way that he walks into a room and yet there are subtle differences in the way that you hold yourself in scenes depending on what's yeah. the situation that he's in you know who are the other people that he's in a room with in conversation and so how did you find the the subtle differences that you wanted to have depending on the situation or depending on the character dynamic at play yeah, he's, he's kind of like, for example, in, in the sort of, um, and they called it the conference room, <laughs> in the council, because <laughs> it is a conference room, in the council chamber. Um, you know, I, I think because these people go in there every day, I think if we sat stiff in chairs every day, it just wouldn't feel right. So there was one type of body language when we sat in those meetings in those council meetings. And then there's another one when he's in his chambers. So his physicality just changed very, very subtly. And he's a different guy on the throne. He sits differently on the throne. Now it's not all of a sudden some kingly posture, but now I'm doing my job. Now I'm publicly sitting upon this powerful seat. And I and, and this is how I sit upon this seat. So it, it did change subtly through it. Um, in the different scenes that, that we were in, it becomes something different. It becomes empowered in a different way when he's in the throne room and particularly, you know, being a, 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 a ruler. Um, but even then I didn't want to sort of overemphasize it in any way or fall back on all the, the cliches in some way. Um, but um, 
I did an interview with somebody and, and they were saying, you know, they talked about how Damon sits on the throne. You know, he kind of lounges and he looks really comfortable and you look uncomfortable. I said, I know what the throne is. It's a haunted seat. People have died on those swords. This isn't some luxurious seat that we sit on here. It's a, it's a haunted item, you know, and it's a possessed item. And when Viserys gets cut by it in the first episode, it literally starts to eat him alive, this thing. It's poisonous. It's not something you lounge around on. Um, it's something you treat very respectfully. So that's what I kind of took into that thing is that, that room as well, that when you sit on this thing, there's also this other power that comes from the seat that, that kind of in, in, like infuses into you. I also really like something that you've said in, in terms of some of the external aspects when it comes to the wigs and the costumes of really allowing that to do the work itself. And is that something where... You know, are there times in roles where you lean a little bit more into the experience of, of stepping into a costume and stepping into some of those facets? Or is it very much for you just about always letting the external aspects do their job and really just focusing on the character underneath? I, I find it's better if you focus on the character underneath because the, that's already doing the work. The costumes are absolutely fantastic. They, they certainly make you stand a different way. A costume does have an effect on you. A piece of clothing does anyway. Um, and so there was very much um, a kind of different reaction within the different, the costumes as well had determined the posture too, how I sat too, you know. Uh, but I think you can't let those do the work for you. And I, I, I worked years ago with a really great acting coach and he was working with, some, with a, a young actor who was playing a king in a play. And he said, this young actor came out and he was all like, you know, la di da and he kind of spoke to him afterwards and he says, you know, when you walk in, he says, you don't have to do all that shit. He says, that thing on your head tells you that you are the king, that tells the audience that you're the king. So that's all you have to do is uh, that will tell the story. This tells the story. You've got to be the person underneath it. So I don't have to walk in and go, oh, hello, how are we this morning? I'm the king. It, it doesn't, it feels bake and it doesn't wash so and I think it's the same with makeup it's like it's just there it, it's sometimes you know you put a set of teeth or a wig on and you start behaving in a different way and um, I find that really interesting but with somebody like Viserys I, I was very mindful that I couldn't start letting that stuff do the work for me and you've just got to work through it um, act act through it and just go to the core of of the fundamentals of what the scene is and what it's about really I really love that. And, and going back to the initial table read that you did for the show as well, um, there was a note that Miguel Sipochnik gave you at the end of it of kind of like bringing more of yourself into the character. And so I was interested in, in terms of what that note meant to you and, and how you really saw the path to bring some of yourself into this character and some of his perspectives in the show. Yeah, because I don't have a lot of confidence um, when I go into a project. Um, I think I can sit back a little bit hold back a little bit and I, and until somebody says hey you know it's okay to play go on then then I then I open up and start to play because I've done I've done jobs where they've been very improvisational it's been very free and then I've literally done all this where if I haven't said one word in a monologue it's been you know kind of the the, the um you know continuity of being up going oh you didn't say and and I'm going really really after that you know one fucking tiny little thing so I think sometimes I felt very restricted in certain jobs you know if that's the that's been the case um and with this one you know we did the read through and I, I hate read throughs but they're really necessary it gets rid of a lot of nerves they get to hear it everyone goes oh you know we don't worry about performing we're just listening to it you know it's we just want to know what it sounds like but there's strange things because some people mumble through them and some people are just absolutely massive in them and I think because that read through for this was such a strange scenario anyway it was like Dr. Strangelove we all we were in some kind of Kubrick spaceship it was weird and it was Covid it was bizarre there's actually pictures of the read through and it looks like we're on the, the Enterprise you know um, and it was just a really unnatural thing and, and I, I find that when you perform it's unnatural so I was reading The King and I was projecting it because someone was 20 feet away over there you know with all the restrictions and it was awful it was just awful anyway and but after it I don't think Miguel was thinking god that was a terrible read everybody I think he was just sort of 
when he came to me at the end, he just had a thought and he took a second and he went, we need to put more Paddy in him. And I think he meant writing wise his character, but I just went back, you know, something went off in my head and I went, okay. And to me, it was just permission to go, right, off you go, have him. And that's how I felt from that moment on. I felt like I owned him and I, and I felt like, right, he's mine and I'm going to do something now with him. Um, and then it just gave me license to be able to bring all these different sort of elements into it, um, which I think, and, you know, I've learned, you know, hey, you, you can do that with everything, man. You don't have to wait for somebody to tell you that's, that's the gig. But it was just quite liberating. And I think it made, gave me this sense of ownership over this area. Like I wasn't just playing a role and delivering it. It, it gave me license to own him. And, and that's what I felt. I felt very protective of him, even as a character. I, I loved him as a character and still do. Um, he was a real joy to play. So I think that's what Miguel meant. So then I started to sort of have these, because I'm quite a reactive person anyway. The fact that people kept calling Viserys week, I took personally. You know, so all these things were building up in me and I was just starting to get more and more angry about this, that people around were like thinking he was some weak guy. And I turned to Miguel again one day and Ryan and I said, we were shooting one scene and, I, and, and it was going one way and, and, and it was a slightly conflicting scene where, you know, Viserys was quite passive in it. And I just went, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. I said, this guy ha at some point has to show these people that he's a fucking dragon, that he's not, a, he's not a pushover. He's not some jolly pushover. It's like, if you really, really push me, I won't like it, but I will cut out your fucking tongue. Do you know? And, and I think I brought that into him as well that wasn't there. There was that sort of level of like, yeah, I'm the nice guy. I'm a good guy, but don't fuck with me. Um, so it just gave me the sort of, uh, you know, the, the freedom to bring and build him as a character wider than what was initially really on the page. And, and in the way that you've built him with the trajectory that he's going on throughout the season, you know, it's it's kind of very, very clear where things are going for him in terms of the, the deterioration, which is both an emotional and a physical thing for him as a character. And there's so many jumps forward in terms of timing every single episode, you know, especially between five and six, which is about 10 years apart. Um, yeah. and, and you've talked about how it, it helps you to start with the end idea of a character and then to kind of work backwards. And it sounds like that's not something unique to this character that even if you're writing or directing or playing another role that kind of always helps you to arc it and how did having that process already really help you with a character like this where there are so many significant time jumps to carry him forward through yeah I think I think we started with six so he'd already deteriorated so I, I kind of had some idea of where he was at a certain point and what I imagine these horses had done so I put in this like stoop he has to have a stick and things like that because he can't support himself anymore. And it makes him look like an old man. And they would refer to him, you know, as old Viserys. And even now I'm like, he's not old. He's not old. He's, he's, he's ill. And it's tragic because he's, he's not an old man, but he looks like one. Um, but as far as the end point, I, was, I, was, I really love an artist, a New York street artist called uh, Richard Hambleton. And he used to do these shadow figures down in, you know, the Bowery and places like that in New York. And uh, I watched the documentary and he got cancer and he got scoliosis and he got cancer in his face. And I, I sent Miguel some pictures early on and I said, I really love this guy. I said, this is a really good model for where Viserys ends up at the end. So I always had this visual by the time we did, when we did six, I'd already started to kind of form that. So I kind of knew in my mind where I wanted to go by, uh, you know, the later episodes. Um, so, yeah, in my mind, I already had an end point. What happened was that at some point in the process, Gita got, uh, when Gita was on board, who directs, um, I think she does eight and ten or something like that. And um, she, she'd had a talk with Miguel and they come up with this idea that, Viserys is very gaunt. He like it's almost like cancerous how he's deteriorated. And we spoke about this because I, you know my dad died of cancer, and I literally watched him go to a kind of a skeleton 
You know, it's an awful thing to have to watch. Um, and what that meant then was that, I mean, it was it went more extreme than I'd imagined, but that was really, really helpful. Because by the end of Becerra's kind of life, he's in just he's just in agony. He's barely existing. He's on the it's basically on opium and you know, he's not living anymore and he's not doing duty anymore. And and also what I brought to that was there's there's some people, and I, and I think my mother, God bless her, who I adored. I think she's somebody, she was sick pretty much all of my life, as I remember. And to the point where she eventually went blind, she lost both her legs and it was diabetes. But she she neglected herself. I think a lot of onus was put on us as children. That, you know, we'd neglected her, but I don't think she had much love for herself at some point. I think she neglected herself and... and you know, ultimately, that, that's a tragic thing. I think my mum started to become her illness. And I think sometimes when people get sick, I'm not saying an ex, it's an excuse, but it means that they don't have to face certain things, that they can use their illness as a shield to go, well, I don't, I don't do that, and I don't go there, and I don't. And then they start to sort of disappear. And I saw that with my mother. And it's a really sad thing to see because you do want to help somebody. But the hardest thing is when somebody's beyond it, is just beyond help like they've mentally just given up so i took that as a way of kind of looking at that with my mother and kind of exercising that sort of thing well not even exercising it but just exploring it so i took that element of my mother and her love because she was a very loving person and i put that in the series that, that how tactile he is and how he, he you know he has grandchildren and he kisses them and I wanted that affection and that love to be in him because I think that's a really powerful thing. So I, I put that in, into, um, into Viserys because at some point he starts to do that. He, he actually says, you know, I don't deal with these things anymore. Alison and Otto deal with them. And it's almost high on the milk of the poppy that they have. And it's just pushed it all away and he can't do it anymore. And I think that's part of him. He wants to die. I think he gets to a point in his life anyway where he wants to die. And, and I, already, I always had a, an image in my head when he died of what vision he saw. And I tried to share it with Gita. And I, I, don't, I don't know if it was properly understood because it wasn't within story context. But when he died, the last thing that he sees that takes him through is obviously Emma, who he... You know what I mean? So that was my thing for dying. It was like, you know, finally, I can leave this world and I can, I can be with you and my pain is now over. So all well, that's not expressed in words. I think it's something that I just held inside me as a motivation so through, through those scenes, you know. I love that. And, and I did also want to talk about the language of the show because the writing is so specific in terms of, of the format and structure of sentences and where words are placed in, in the same way that, you know, if you're working with a, a Shakespearean text, that there's a real musicality and a rhythm to it. There's a real musicality and rhythm to the writing of, of this yeah. show. And so what was your approach to working with the dialogue and finding what the very natural delivery of your character would be um, in terms of that specific rhythm? Yeah, it's something you have to find. And I think the more experienced actors with that kind of language are better at it. I think I got better as the show went on at it. Um, and I think it's just one of those things that once it locks in, it's okay. But it's also a trap. You can't become too entombed in that rhythm too because it's something that's very easy to fall back on. And you can see actors do that that are in shows long term. They start to do it. But my thing when I read it was... Oh, how do I make this sound authentic? And how do I make it sound like kind of human? How do I take this grand speak and make it a kind of everyday thing without every line being delivered on some kind of, you know, level of, uh, I'm just sort of going, how the fuck do I avoid all that crap? So you just have to, you know, just have to break it down and get to the subtext of it. And then once you start to learn and crack that, you realise they're just words. I mean, I, I did a Shakespeare thing years ago, but I was so terrified of it because I'd never read or done Shakespeare. And once I worked with somebody, and, and, and I played Banco in a, in a screen version of Macbeth, and once I sat with somebody and read 
and they explained to me what was within the text. It was like, I just went, oh, oh, wow. And it just, it just hit somewhere on a different level. And I thought, oh, I've always been afraid of this. But actually, once you get to the under, under it and you get to the meaning of it, then they're just words, man. They, it can be written in anything. So I think that was the trick with House of the Dragon was to sort of try and get under it a little bit. And you've got to be on top of it because you can't just rock up and improvise on a show like that. And I think at first we were a bit like, you know, oh, here, the odd words, you know, and you go, oh, God, and you kind of go, it's not fucking Shakespeare, mate. And then you kind of go, well, it kind of is. I'm not saying it's Shakespeare, but I'm going, but you, you've got to treat it with the same respect. You know, you've got to make it Shakespeare. That's what your job is. And, it, and when you get into it and you get underneath it, you realise that it's re actually really fucking great writing that they've done. And they're very clever and they've managed to create this thing and, and, and with all these fantastic little relationships and things going on. And you think, ah, yeah. Yeah, it was always there. It was just my resistance, my fear going, how the fuck do I make this work? You know, how do I make this be authentic? But once you crack it, it's a really great thing. It's quite sort of liberating in a way. I really love <laughs> hearing all of these these details about what went into creating him. It's such such a fantastic performance in the show and um, excited that your character's still alive six episodes in and hopefully that continues yeah. a little longer for all of us. Thank you so much, Patty. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cheers.